Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Campus Composting Best Practices, Strategies for Student Engagement and Food Waste and Compostable Serveware Diversion. My name is Larry Cook. I'm the Recycling and Waste Manager at the University of South Carolina, as well as a member of the Kirk Board of Directors. I'll be your moderator today. For those of you not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange and networking opportunities between the staff and student leaders implementing programs. Today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational, educational, and other topics related to collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. Today's program is the second webinar in our 2019 series. I want to thank our partner, AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of sustainability in higher education for the logistical and promotional support of the webinar series. I also want to recognize the Big Ten and Friends Waste Affinity Group for their support and promotion of today's program. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over. If you have problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can reach a live technician by calling GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. I don't think it started. Um, the presentation, Larry? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I think we had some technical difficulties. Um, I am going to start the webinar over. I hope this isn't a repeat for folks. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Campus Composting Best Practices. My name is Larry Cook and I'm the Waste and Recycling Manager at the University of South Carolina, as well as a member of the Kirk Board of Directors. I'll be your moderator today. For those of you not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange and networking opportunities between the staff and student leaders implementing programs. Today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational, educational, and other topics related to collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. Today's program is the second webinar in our 2019 series. I want to thank our partner, AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education for the logistical and promotional support of the webinar series. I also want to recognize the Big Ten and Friends Waste Affinity Group for their support and promotion of today's program. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over. If you have problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can reach a live technician by calling GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. To avoid background noise, we've placed all but our panelists' lines on mute. We encourage you to submit questions at any time, however, by using the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Simply click the plus symbol where it says questions to type us a note, and we will read as many of these as possible out loud at the end of the presentations. Copies of today's presentation slides will be available to download and a recording available to stream within the next day or so from the Kirk website, www.curc. 3r.org. On today's webinar, we'll hear three presentations focused on ways collegiate recycling and sustainability programs have developed on their campus, food, on their campus uh, to divert food waste and organics. Um, we'll start with a presentation from Jen Maxwell of Appalachian State University. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Brian Barnes of the University of Louisville. Finally, we'll hear from Gina Talt from Princeton University. 
Jen Maxwell has been with Appalachian State University since 2006 and leads the campus zero waste efforts, student outreach and engagement, food pantry free store, green certifications and events, and the sustainable film series. She is a founding member of the Appalachian State University Sustainability Council and Living Green Residential Learning Community. Beyond Appalachian, Jen is the chair of the Collegiate Recyclers Coalition of North and South Carolina and the secretary of the board of directors for the College and University Recycling Coalition, a national organization that represents a vibrant community of waste reduction, recycling, and sustainability professionals in higher education. She studied and received her BS in appropriate technology in 2001 and master's in higher education university leadership in 2017, both from Appalachian. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Larry. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me be here today. I appreciate it. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about our program here. Um, we are, let's see, hold on a sec. Okay, um, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, so a little bit about Appalachian State. We are in the mountains in Western North Carolina, a um, little over 19,000 students, um, about 375 developed acres of land, 30 academic buildings, 20 residence halls, with around 5,600 students living on campus. We have quite a bit of construction right now, so that's um, set to expand here in the next few years. Three main dining facilities and 11 rec facilities and, and athletic facilities and a pretty large stadium, or well, large for us, I guess. Um, we have a strategic plan that sustainability is at its core um, for the university. So we have a pretty large commitment to sustainability overall. And then we also have some commitments to zero waste. Um, so I want, I'll want i be focusing on composting, but I wanted to kind of mention one of our programs we're really proud of as well that um, we've been doing for about um, 20 years, too, is food recovery on campus. So we work with a local, um, the Hunger and Health Coalition and Hospitality House to do food donation daily. Um, so we are really proud of that program as well. Um, so a little bit of history of composting here. This is our 20th year. We're really proud of that. Um, it started as a student project, and I actually um, got to be um, uh -oh. what's going on. I'm wondering if you all can hear me. There you go. You're you're you should be good to go. Okay. Should I do I need to start over or I think you're good. We could hear you, we okay. just couldn't see your screen. Okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> um okay, so um we started as a student project back in ninety nine and I actually um was one of the students that helped that project. So it's been really awesome for me to have the opportunity to sort of see it grow over the years. Um we are permitted through the state of North Carolina. That's a requirement here. And so we are what's called a type three facility. And I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, when we first started, you can see the photo here. We did it really low tech. So we did perforated pipe and an old blower motor that um, I actually found in the dumpster and that my friend um, worked on. So we got it working. And so we started with just one coffee shop on campus and um, a little bit of veggie prep. Um, and some lemons. We make lots of lemonade here. So, um, and one of the things that was happening was really um, we were expanding beyond the space that we had available. Um, so, one of the reasons that we built a new facility here, which I'll show you in the next slide, and um, also we had some issues with water quality. Um, the Division of Water Quality here in North Carolina had gotten a lot more heavily involved in permitting um, a little later after this first permit cycle that we went through um, years ago. And so that was another reason that we were able to, to expand and build our new facility that we have built, um, which you can see in the photo here. Um, we opened this facility in 2011 and we worked with a local 
business partner advanced composting to um, they were historically animal mortality composting and they were really interested in tapping into the food waste world a bit and we started a partnership with them to be their first food waste facility um, and again I mentioned earlier the type 3 facility is our permitting which means that we can take pre and post consumer um, as well as meat and dairy and things like that in our facility. Um, just some photos of the process early on. So I'm going to touch on some of our challenges that we've had. And um, one of those you can see in the top left is it's pretty manual labor intensive with the small barrels and things. So it's not good for people's backs. So um, when I go through the challenges, you'll see. But this is just a couple pictures of the process. And then bottom right photo of our finished product, which is some really nice compost. Um, so why we chose this facility, one of the reasons was the partnership with Advanced Composting. Um, we like to be really innovative here, and so we felt it was a really great opportunity to partner with them. Um, with location and space, for us, space is an issue, as in most colleges and universities is an issue. So we, um, you know, space was limited. This was where we were composting before, and also through the permitting, there are some requirements. Um, that you can't be within a certain vicinity of um, distance from a residential area or well or stream. And so we ended up building right back on the location where we were composting before. Um, pretty functional. Um, there's a runoff collection storage for this facility. And that was, like I mentioned earlier, with water quality, one of our biggest issues. The corner of this property has a drain that drains to the South Fork of the New River. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were handling any runoff properly. And so this system has a 1,000-gallon storage tank for any runoff. And um, we're able to oxygenate that tank and keep the microbes alive and use that back into the process. So it's a really nice closed-loop system. Um, it has a really great working pad. We were able to have four piles going at one time. So it was much more space for us than before. We were only able to manage one pile at a time. Um, and it's an aerated facility, so there is aeration in the floors of this system. We're able to turn the air on and off um, each bay when we're using them and not, and then also run them up to about seven minutes per hour. Um, so all of our food waste that we um, compost on campus, and all of our finished product is used back on campus. So this is really the most desired stream for us from a waste zero waste perspective. Um, with the clip, we're doing it right here on site, and then we're able to use the finished product. So we're very proud of that as well. Um, some of the things that we're using it for are different campus gardens. We have a sustainable development teaching farm, and um, just in landscape application in general. Um, so this is a really one of the ways that we're really able to engage students in in using this is through the campus gardens and such because we have lots of student employees and student interns working in those gardens and at the farm as well. Um, it's an educational tool, so it is a really great way for us to do tours for campus and the local community and engage a lot of different people in the process. Um, you'll see just a couple of photos here of different tours we've done. Um, these are just some more kind of value-added um, benefits of having the facility on campus and in-house. Um, research opportunities for students and faculty, as well as internship opportunities. We've had some students do internships with the facility before, um, and obviously research. And then bottom right, you'll see a couple of students just doing some sorting. This is after a football game, but just a really great way to engage our student community. Um, so going through the challenges just a little bit, um, we all have these, and you know we've been composting here for 20 years, but we're still dealing with lots of different challenges and trying to figure it out. So um, labor intensity was one of them for us. Um, the usage of finished product and the quality, um, you know, old food service where we used to have styrofoam on campus, um, so doing away with that was one of the things that, and replacing it with a compostable alternative. Um, as well as other products on campus. Um, education and just getting real, people to really sort properly and understand the sorting process and the composting process. Um, and then one of the challenges that we, we face 
still is that eventually we will outgrow this facility. It'll handle about um, a quarter of our compostable waste stream. So eventually we'll have to find, we don't currently have a local hauler or processor, so we will have to come up with a, another solution down the road. But we have a little time still. Um, so addressing some of those challenges, we have um, per, for the labor intensity, we purchased this truck with a really nice cart lift, um, or we actually just retroed the truck with a Perkins lift. And um, that's been really helpful in transition to a cart system instead of the 20 gallon barrels that we were using. Um, we've tried to do much better education. We've done a whole new, we've revamped all of our signage across campus for recycling landfill and composting with um, color coding and just a little bit more simple mes messaging and really trying to do a lot more training for people, zero waste training across campus. Um, we purchased a screener and um, for that finished product and we've been doing a lot more education for our landscaping crew to um, use the product and the value and benefits of composting and purchasing the screener was really a big deal because um, it really gave a better product. A lot of our even after it's cured, it's because we're using wood chips as our bulking agent, it's pretty woody. So it's been really helpful to have a screened um, product for, for them to use in the end. Um, with purchasing, I mentioned earlier, trying to transition everything and sourcing compostable options. And so one of the things you'll see um, here is a cup that Pepsi provides us as part of their contract. And historically, it was a poly-coated plastic cup. So we had to go in and change the... Um, contract language when the contract came up for renewal in order to be um, focused more on sustainable food service wear and packaging. And so um, that's been a challenge. Some of those contracts are, are very long. That one was actually a nine-year contract, um, a three-year contract with two options for renewal. And so we had to, um, we were able to go in after that nine years and change the language and request that, and, and require that they provide a sustainable um, cup. So um, a mixer, gr mixer grinder is the other thing that we purchased that's been really helpful for us when it comes to post-consumer um, food service where plates and cups and to-go clamshells and things, um, they do break down in compost, but it um, is a challenge sometimes, especially if you have like 20 nested plates or nested cups. And so this piece of equipment has really allowed us to not only mix and homogenize the food waste, but also all of these cardboard containers, pizza boxes, and things like that, too. It's, so it's really helpful. And then we purchased a compost tea brewer, too, to continue to expand our effort. I um, wanted to touch on funding real quick, too, because um, it can be pretty expensive for all of this stuff. And so um, we funded our facility with state operating budget, um, but we have foundation funds and development funds, so donations and things like that that are specific to sustainability for some of the other equipment and stuff that we've purchased. And so um, also internal and external grant funds or other places that you can look for funding. Um, our REI that you see here is a renewable energy initiative on campus. So it's a student led um, initiative and they do renewable energy um, systems on campus with the funding. So it's a student voted fee, like a green fee basically. And so they have um, provided some funds for this, these projects as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that we do zero waste stadium, and so we have been composting in our stadium since about 2014. And this is a really great way for us to engage students as well. So in our office, we have a team of 20 sustainability ambassadors, and they are um, very much involved in the zero waste stadium efforts, as well as other green events on campus. On Mondays, they're helping sort for composting from the stadium at the facility. Um, this last year, we expanded a little bit to our chancellor's tailgate as well. And so, um, you know, it's an opportunity to kind of educate 30,000 people, plus a really great, great way to engage these students in work as well around zero waste, but also sustainability education and outreach in general. Um, so we now that we've got all the pieces in place, last over the last couple of years, we've been expanding quite a bit to academic buildings and um, residence halls. And so we started by piloting, as most people do, just to start small and see how it goes. And we learned a lot from that. Um, and so we're now um, continuing to add composting in all academic and administrative buildings, um, 
All of our residence halls have composting available. We did a zero waste basketball game this year. And um, one of the things that we're doing to expand our student engagement is that we're actually hiring two students that will be focused specifically on composting. So we have a compost facility coordinator that's a staff member in landscaping, and he, he is full time. Um, managing the facility and the permitting and monitoring and all of that. But our office, the sustainability office, is hiring two students to work alongside with him to um, not only do education and outreach, but also program development and just be a part of the process with um, contamination. And as we offer more public compost collection everywhere, contamination becomes more of an issue. And so we are adding these two staff members. It's a really great opportunity for those students to really get heavily engaged in composting and zero waste. So we're excited about that. And they start in the fall. And I'm gonna stop there. I think we have time for questions right now. Is that right, Larry? That's, that's correct. Um, thank you so much, Jen. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question to ask any of today's speakers, click on the plus sign next to the word question on the GoToWebinar dashboard to type this in. Um, so we had a couple questions about funding and staffing. Uh, I think you mentioned that, that the program is funded through operational funds at this point, but if you could um, you know, just kind of list down the staffing of, of the center and, um, you know, talk about full-time, part-time student staff? So with our, um, with the facility itself, that is, it is housed within the physical plant landscape services, so facilities, and they are funded through state operating budget funds, and um, that, that position is a full-time position that is focused on compost operations but they also help with landscaping and stuff. We have lots of snow here, so snow removal and things like that sort of fall under that position as well. With our students, um, every so my role is in the sustainability office, kind of over overseeing um, and directing zero waste for the whole campus in general. Um, and then we have an outreach coordinator um, that works with me to manage our student team. So our both of our positions are full time. 40-hour um, week staff members, and then um, we hire 20 students that do outreach for five hours. The, the ambassadors that I mentioned are five hours a week, plus all day on game day um, for our home games, and they are funded through our funds, which is we are um, we are supported through foundation funds, and so um, partial partial state funds and partial foundation funds, which are donated funds. Um, like I mentioned earlier, so we have, um, you know, donations specifically for sustainability. We have a development officer that raises funds specifically for sustainability as well. And so um, that's where our budget comes from, both of those areas, state and foundation. And those students, so the two students that we'll be hiring in the fall that will be 10 hours a week for composting specifically will report to our office and be paid through our office, so they'll report to myself and Rebecca, our outreach coordinator, but they will work really closely with Max, our facility coordinator. So it's gonna be really interesting to see kind of how that relationship works. We So we have a zero waste leadership team that I chair that is with facilities. And so that person, those students will really kind of work through that team. So we hope it's gonna work well, but we're this is the first time that we've done this where we manage and they basically work for with um, the facility coordinator. So. Great. Um, so a little bit more about uh, collection as you've expanded the program into academic buildings and residence halls. Um, how do, does custodial assist with that collection or have there been positive or potentially um, uh, controversial interactions maybe between departments um, as, as you've expanded into, you know, outside of food service, essentially? So what we've done with, um, you know, our academic building specific, with our, well, with our residence hall, students are already required to bring their recycling and their trash out of the building. And so it was a real natural fit for them to, and it's a volunteer, if they want to compost, they can. 
Um, in the academic buildings, we ended up going with the same system that it's really volunteer. So if a department wants to compost, then we provide them a small container for their kitchen. Um, and they are responsible for bringing it to the outside cart. And we're using 65 and 95 gallon carts, green carts. And so um, they bring it to the outside cart and then Max, the facility coordinator, picks those up on three times a week. He does a route on campus. And so with the with the departments being responsible for it, we haven't we don't change the process for housekeeping yet. And so we have a great relationship with housekeeping. They do handle the recycling and the landfill. And so we've transitioned over the years to have them do that. It didn't used to be that way. And so we do have a great relationship, but when you're adding a third sort, it just made the most sense for us to start with a volunteer volunteer opportunity and having our faculty and staff much more engaged too. If you want to participate, you do, and you have to take it outside. And so that's been really successful for us. Um, I think that, you know, that's the way we're going to manage it for quite a while. And then, you know, down the road, eventually we may transition to where we have bins everywhere in, in all of the hallways. But right now we're focusing on, the kitchens and break rooms and things like that. Great. Um, we've got several questions asking about return on investment and um, diversion impact. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, if there are any savings from landfill diversion or, or waste hauling costs um, and uh, what kind of an impact on your total waste stream the the composting program is is having how much um you know are you avoiding sending to the landfill mm -hmm. so um as far as avoided costs you know with us the tipping fee was for us about 52 dollars a ton um so there's that avoided cost there we had calculated um, return on investment for our facility itself at about 10 years if that's if it's running at max capacity um which we're not, but you know, um, we still have a lot of room to expand. And then as far as diversion, um, right now we are composting about six to eight percent of our total waste stream. And um, we did a waste audit in 2013 and found that about a third of our waste stream could be composted. So we have a lot of room to grow and expand um, the compostable part of our stream. And like I said, it's really our most desired diversion because it stays right here on campus. Great. And um, then another question about the post-consumer. Uh, it sounds like with volunt a voluntary program that would help just in and of itself reduce contamination, but are you having to do any additional pre-sorting uh, for that material? Are you trying to keep it separate from uh, the back of the house stuff that, that's more established or does it come in pretty clean? Um, it's not as clean, and, and contamination is a real issue, especially at the residence halls is where we've seen the most. Um, and so that was part of the reason for hiring the students was to really help with some pre-sorting. Um, with our facility coordinator, he's willing to sort a little bit as well, which is really nice too. So I think um, the back of the house stuff is pretty much separate, and it's very clean. And so, um, you know, the the having these students is really going to be super helpful for addressing those issues as we continue to expand and offer more public collection in our dining, all of our dining facilities and stuff. Okay, and one final question before we move on, uh, just maybe a little bit more specifics on the kinds of compostable serveware um, you've had success with and, and uh, how you handle that, say in the zero waste stadium or with zero waste events. Um, to both to make sure that what you can handle is used and um, uh, you know just general education about that sort of uh, material. So um, we have a variety of different stuff in our stadium. A lot of it is just paper that isn't coated, you know, and so um, which is just as compostable as your you know labeled and and marketed compostable ware, but we do use quite a bit of eco products materials right now in our food service facility. So our clamshells and plates and um, the cups, the Pepsi cups, I'm not sure 
who makes those, honestly. But I'm happy to share, to get a little bit more information from food services on very specifics and, and be happy to share. If somebody's interested, they can shoot me an email. Are, are there any, so, so for example, the PLA cold cups, are there any things that, that you found that you just really can't break down in your current facility? We've, we've been pretty successful in what is breaking down. Um, and I know that the mixer is really helpful for that because it really breaks up. It's a mixer, but it has some knives. And um, and so those knives are really helping to break this stuff down. And so we, have been, we haven't had any issues, issues thus far. The compostable bags take a little longer to break down, um, but they do, especially the knot if they're knotted. So the knot will be there. You'll see it a lot of times. So we just kind of put that stuff back through the system. But um, so far, so good as far as what we're using. Great. Um, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, no that problem. Was, um, that was a great presentation. Our next presenter is... Dr. Brian Barnes. He is an educator, activist, and entrepreneur based in Louisville, Kentucky. And hang on, let me just uh, get this up. Um, Dr. Barnes holds a PhD from the University of Louisville in interdisciplinary humanities, a master's in philosophy from University of Louisville, and a bachelor's in philosophy from Hanover College in Indiana. He is part-time faculty in philosophy departments of at uh, University of Louisville, Indiana University Southeast, Bellarmine University, and Spalding University. He is also a scholar and teacher at the Foundation for Critical Thinking in Northern California and has been an Arabic crypto cryptologic linguist in the U.S. Army and at the National Security Agency. Barnes got his formal start in sustainability when he was a manager at a wild oats grocery store and joined a nonprofit composting organization, Breaking New Grounds. Barnes was trained in urban agriculture systems during his six years at BNG by MacArthur Fellow Will Allen and his team at Growing Power in Milwaukee. Dr. Barnes is currently a member of the sustainability leadership team at the University of Louisville. He directs the UofL EcoReps program, which promotes peer-to-peer -peer sustainability education for faculty, staff, and students across the university, as well as promoting sustainable, sustainability initiatives like UofL's Food Recovery Network. Barnes also teaches a senior seminar in the sustainability program and chairs a standing committee on sustainable engagement for UofL Sustainability Council. Since 2009, Barnes also manages the U of L Community Composting Project, which hosts weekly volunteer composting workshops year-round and created around 200 tons of compost and vermicompost last year from local food wastes using a carbon-negative process. Barnes also teaches anchor sustain sustainability courses for Indiana University Southeast, and he has taught a sustainability-themed inter interdisciplinary seminar at Bellarmine University for more than a decade. Dr. Barnes produces and co-hosts Critical Thinking for Everyone on 106.5 FM Forward Radio in Louisville, a weekly radio show that is concerned with good thinking practices around sustainability and other issues of general interest. With that, I'll hand it over to Brian. I got those boxes. Oh, wow. Thanks so much. Um, so I hope that doesn't come out of my time. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> uh, sorry, anyway, uh, that, yeah, all that is me, though, for sure. So uh, thanks so much, Larry, and thanks for this opportunity. I really appreciate Kirk being interested in our project. Um, this is, boy, I was really impressed with what Jen had to say. That was beautiful. <laughs> Every bit of that. Um, at Appalachian State, uh, we do some we do some things differently at U of L. Uh, sustainability at the University of Louisville over the ten years I've been working on this project has been a difficult sell, and uh, I have to give a lot of credit to our sustainability coordinator. That's the uh, pointy tip of the spear at U of L for sustainability stuff. Um, that's uh, Dr. Justin Mogg, um, and he is um, he's an inspiration at U of L for sure, um, and and makes sure all the things get done. So this project um, is really an attempt to uh, prove a concept and maybe it got out of hand. I'll let you be the judge um, at the end of the day. So this is, this is the map. Um, UofL is an urban campus, about 25,000 students. It's been around since 1798. Um, and uh, we have a pretty 
deep reach into the local community in Louisville. Um, this uh, this is our site. Um, it's about three blocks from U of L. If you're looking at the bottom of the screen, um, you would be able to walk from the main campus to this about three blocks. Um, and um, at one end of the site, we have vermiculture. That's the site, the end of the site that has the X in the box. And at the other end of the site, we have uh, compost dumpsters. Um, there, here's one shot of one one angle on our site. Uh, these are uh, a, an early round of compost dumpsters. Um, we now have 17 dumpsters. Those dumpsters were uh, decommissioned essentially by the university when we switched uh, waste providers. Um, this was in 2008, 2009, and I found the dumpsters in a pile uh, on that physical plant site and asked the university if I could set up a composting project. Um, and this is <laughs> it doesn't look a whole lot different today. I wish I could say that it's a, it's a real uh, picturesque spot, but only if you like uh, do-it-yourself composting. Uh, here's you know what we use, nitrogen, of course, nitrogen sources. Uh, we'll take pretty much everyth everything. Uh, we have in the past limited meat because we don't use machines to do the composting. We use human labor. That's why we're carbon negative. The only machines involved in our composting um, is... Um, is the uh, getting it to the site with you know with uh, some kind of a vehicle other than that uh, we use humans to do it so there's our nitrogen here's some carbon from a local carpenter dropped off some sawdust i'm um, standing in some coffee grounds and some sawdust there inside of a dumpster uh, we also use wood chips like uh, jen was talking about super dense uh, we have to send them through good lord how many times we just keep we just keep putting the wood chips through anyway uh, we have wood chips free on the site because the university uh, mulches uh, wood waste uh, for the campus on the site uh, and so we're able to avail ourselves of all the free carbon that we want so we really have to worry about the nitrogen um, and so one of our uh, ways that we get nitrogen is through partnering with local organizations. Uh, our project uh, historically has not been funded by the university. Uh, beginning this uh, coming academic year, there'll be some administrative costs put in there, thank goodness. Um, but for uh, all these all this time so far, we've been uh, we find funding sources from outside the university. One of them is Heine Brothers Coffee. Uh, you see the back of one of their coffee shops here. They pay us to pick up the coffee grounds that they save and we compost that material. Um, sometimes I got to use my own car to do it. That's a, a beauty shot there of, uh, of me trying to load as many five gallon buckets full of coffee grounds as I can into my car, not an uncommon sight um, low this decade. Of course, we get uh, donations in all forms and sometimes we get strange containers and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, and as long as it's compostable material, we are ready to work with it. So typically we combine the stuff in a dumpster. You see here coffee grounds and food waste. Uh, we will of course need a layer of carbon on that before we're uh, ready to let it cook for a while. We also do it on the ground. Uh, overwhelmingly what we get are coffee grounds uh, every week. At this point we're processing about 7,000 pounds of coffee grounds a week at our site, um, which as you, as you might imagine takes a lot of student labor and volunteer labor. Yeah, so um, I mentioned the coffee grounds. Uh, we also, uh, let's see, we did um, 20 tons of compost last year um, in 2007. Um, I, did I get my math right? 200,000 pounds. Um, and so uh, about 7,000 pounds of that gets turned into, um, uh, gets turned into vermicompost at our site and we give all of it away. So there, um, there, there aren't any costs to get this material from the university. It is a community service project. Uh, we're trying to do a social justice thing, which not everybody's trying to do. And it's certainly not to disparage anyone who's doing this differently. You know, there was de there de definitely was no budget when this thing got started. So uh, if we wanted to do it, um, it was going to be different. And the university was not excited about the notion initially when we're doing this little gonzo project on the side, uh, they weren't very interested in us uh, selling that stuff in the name of the university. So um, there's been a lot of resistance over the years. Um, a lot of people are championing the project and have for some time. And so, so things are improving for sure. And I have to say that um, I feel very positive about composting at UofL going forward. Uh, but, uh, but that's kind of the way that it's gone. Uh, after we 
uh, finished with the um, with the compost. We take it down here and put it into the worm room. We have a very small footprint. You see almost the entire footprint of our vermiculture facility, if you want to call it that, um, in uh, right right here in this shot. Um, and we process uh, by using these, uh, you know, essentially processing 25 gallons at a time. Uh, of vermicompost with uh, with red wigglers, um, and uh, and we process that, we screen it, and we make that available to anybody who wants to come get it as well. Uh, there are some of the red wigglers doing some work. I've got thousands of beauty shots, um, a couple of them for this. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we make about seven seven thousand pounds of this stuff every year uh, and give it away. Uh, so. Breaking new grounds. Uh, I know that Larry mentioned that in my introduction. I encourage people who are interested in trying to figure out how do you how do you get this thing started. Breaking new grounds was a really cool um, a really cool project that was around for seven years in Louisville and it had a national reach. Um, and that was the thing that was uh, sort of uh, helped out by MacArthur Fellow Will Allen. He gave us a process which is to if you're going to do urban agriculture, uh, make the soil the foundation of that and the red wigglers are the foundation of the soil. And so compost is central to all of that. Um, and that's what we try to do at Breaking New Grounds. Uh, we partner with these organizations. I was a manager at Wild Oats. That's how I got involved at the time. Um, and we had some other local partners who put some money in for a few years uh, to help us go. We were trying to make a sustainable organization um, that would ma manage itself and pay all the workers and do all that. And unfortunately, it didn't it didn't go the whole distance. But what it did do was teach me a lot about vermiculture and about compost and give me a lot of great opportunities. And so I took those to U of L. Um, I was in the faculty Senate um, in 20 in 2009. Uh, you know, doing part of my service, and I uh, I met Justin Mogg, uh, the sustainability coordinator, after a faculty senate meeting, and I asked him, hey, what about these uh, dumpsters? What about doing some composting here? And and so we got started with um, with talks, if you will. <laughs> it took uh, about nine months for us to get anyone to agree to give us a shot and to give us a piece of land where we could do this. Um, Sodexo helped us out by gathering all of the food waste on campus. We had no one getting paid for this. Um, I managed to get a lot of student interest in this operation. Um, so we would get anywhere from five to ten students showing up on Sunday mornings, usually about seven o'clock in the morning and working for about six or eight hours to get 5,000 pounds of waste processed. Um, and that was every week for uh, about two years. Uh, the, the compost that we made went to the Garden Commons, which is a teaching garden and in a community garden for anyone um, in the community, not just on campus, but anyone um, to um, eat the food that's grown there. U of L is situated in the middle of the urban core. You can't. Um, there's no. There's not. There's not a strong effort made to keep people from walking through campus. Um, it just happens all the time. And so anyone's encouraged to get food from U of L uh, at the Garden Commons. And also, uh, there's a composting station there. I'll show you some photos of that later on. During this period, we also worked with the local Americana Community Center to help them start their own compost project, which is really cool for us. And we ended up winning um, the University's Community Engagement Award, which is given out to only one um, organization or individual during the uh, the academic year. So we were really honored with that. Uh, this is a one shot of the Garden Commons. It's actually quite large. It wraps around um, a, a, a our cultural center, which is a, a multi-use building on campus. Um, and we encourage everyone to come and help us out. This is, boy, this is an old photo. We've got a lot more there now. But anyway, just uh, one shot of that. Uh, native native plants, a lot of uh, fruit bearing and uh, uh, plants, vegetables. Uh, we do have also uh, raised beds there. Um, we attracted the Master Gardener program, which is a, a program through our local um, uh, community. Um, County Agricultural Extension. Um, the gentleman there on the left is Steve, and he's the the master of the master gardeners, and he, he brings them out every year to learn about compost at our site and to uh, learn that we are a community resource uh, that's available. So we're really happy with our relationship with the Master Gardener Program. Uh, here's Americana Community Center. They continue to have a very robust community garden that has grown up with the help of some of our organizations at UofL and other schools in the area, and just a lot of great buy-in from the people around the community center. And uh, we've had some reciprocal compost trade there. Uh, we built them some of these bins, again, like who's getting paid on these things? Nobody, so um, community members are doing it. There's often a very low or no budget 
um, all of these designs, everything that you might see on the, in these um, in these uh, photos are available online. <laughs> Just uh, if you want to go out there and Google them or something for free. And of course, I'm available to consult anywhere anybody wants to bring me. Um, if you want to talk about these things, um, we have a lot of information available also for you to do it on your own at louisville.edu slash sustainability. Anyway, um, the university liked it so much that uh, they hired a contractor to do it. Blue Skies Composting came in. Um, and so we lost our source of nitrogen, which created a huge problem. Uh, we did win another university award for, for student engagement that year, the Soul Award. I'll show you some photos of that. Really great stuff. We were featured in the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's uh, report on community composting in 2014, I believe, um, which is a DC-based organization that puts out free information. You're probably aware. Um, we have um, an organization uh, called FoodWorks uh, through the Middlebury uh, college, a uh, program that helps uh, students uh, learn about sustainability tasks. That's expanded. Uh, they started off working with U of L, and I've hosted many uh, FoodWorks interns over the years at the composting project. Um, at least, at least six. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, could be, could be a few, one way or the other. And then uh, when we didn't have a source of nitrogen, a a community group made up of some students, but also just community members grew up to find sources for us. And they did find about 35 community sources. They brought those nitrogen sources um, to our composting project for free. Um, they didn't charge anybody on either end. They did it as a community service and <clears throat> they called themselves Feed the Dirt. There's the team right there. Um, None of them are involved in the, in the project now, except for one person who is our long-term vermiculturist. I won't point her out in the photo, but um, this is a really cool group. Um, they even worked in the winter. Of course, we always work in the winter because the trash never stops. So we're always, um, we're always out there working uh, at least once a week. Uh, these days, with a little more structure, we managed to get in uh, maybe a few more days. Um, this is Seoul. Um, this is a, uh, a university partnership. Um, I don't need to go into the details, but anyway, they came out for a work day and they ended up uh, voting us as the uh, university partner they were most excited about working with during that year, which is great. Um, we had uh, interns from the uh, Middlebury Food Works program, as I mentioned, and during uh, these years, the university caught on and lots of employees came out and brought their own vehicles to get our compost to take home to their gardens and to their and to their personal farms. Um, unfortunately, Feed the Dirt decided to go a different direction, and so they they left um, and disbanded uh, for reasons that didn't really have anything to do with us, but it did affect us very deeply, such that we didn't have anybody bringing nitrogen to us now. And so during uh, these few months uh, in 2014, we had to really think about what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, and if we were going to go further. Uh, we did manage to get a license during this period with the city of Louisville to compost. Um, our license uh, is good as long as we give the compost away, essentially, um, and as long as we operate for an educational purpose. We are expanding that now into a Kentucky license. Um, we haven't had the need to do that yet, but we have acquired some partnerships that make that necessary. And I'll talk about those as we move forward. Um, Honey Brothers Coffee really stepped up um, and became a source for us. You can see <laughs> this is about, uh, this photo is about 5,000 grounds, about, about 5,000, 4,000 pounds of coffee grounds one day um, with some coffee chaff um, and some other related materials. Uh, we hauled that in our van that we pulled out of the trash there, the compost machine. Um, the local artist was kind enough to um, to uh, design for us and paint. And then, of course, this we spent several hours processing this in the dumpster with wood chips. We also work with Raising Hope Organic Farm. Uh, that's uh, nearby, and we take them compostables um, in order to help us alleviate some of our overflow um, at times when we have low labor. Um, they help us out and they make compostables out of our material as well. Uh, Black Acre Nature Conservancy has 350 community garden plots and they need compost. And so we partner with them also for projects like making compostables, as you see here, but we also, um, U of L Echo Reps, along with some other partners, which is another organization I manage, uh, built that hoop house for them in the background. So uh, we try to do a lot of things with Black Acre when we get opportunities. 
Um, we do have local partners of various types coming in, getting the compost. Of course, people know about us now, so they come out and get our compost. Um, this is Amanda from Lots of Food, who grows food on vacant lots um, that the city um, has provided for her and her team. Um, and they use our compost, among others, to grow that food and have been very happy with it over the years. Partners keep coming back. This is Aaron. Aaron uh, was our first student worker. It wasn't a great fit for Aaron, but we loved having him. He helped us establish the program. Um, and for the last four years, we've had Candy. Um, she's actually gone through a graduate program and come out on the other side and continues to work with us um, at this point, uh, going into her fifth year. Um, we, uh, we have some other folks, uh, Patrick, for example, here working with Candy. Um, and um, Josh is our is our current employee. I didn't manage to get a picture of Josh in here, but he's an undergraduate sustainability major, and um, he and Candy together are a fantastic team. We have a lot of student engagement. We get about 500 students out to the site um, every year uh, for educational purposes through various connections, some of which I've talked about already, the others of which I'll just uh, roll through very quickly here in the time that I have left. Um, and so uh, we also, uh, we partner with, uh, at this point, nine local schools and uh, maybe maybe 20 different local organizations um, to provide compostables for us or we provide compost um, for them along with the compostable so they don't just come pick it up, but we have a reciprocal agreement. Um, some of those are paid now, which is great. and. Uh, Heine Brothers and some other partners who I'm going to mention at the end of this uh, program uh, pay the bills so that we can uh, fund the students. And like I mentioned, U of L is going to provide um, some administrative stuff. Um, it's uh, $10,000 uh, for the year, so not a lot if you can find somebody willing to do it for that, I suppose. Um, here are some students sorting worms out of vermicompost. Vermicompost is non-toxic. You can put your hands in it. Nobody gets sick from it. it the worm's gut kills a lot of uh, pathogenic bacteria, and so students are encouraged to sift through the vermicompost and pull out the worms um, in order to or learn about worm habitats. Um, we use the material for wildflower planting here on campus. Students did that work. Uh, we have students decorating one of our compost vans. Again, a van we pulled out of the trash. Students decorated it so we can get around town. We use that van as a closet now, so not exactly the same. Um, I teach a couple of classes in critical thinking and business ethics. I have assignments that line up with composting. Students come out and provide their labor in order to fulfill their assignments. Uh, they do have other options if they don't want to come out to composting, but many still do. Greek organizations on campus come out and do um, uh, service projects a couple of times a year. Uh, we get infusions of up to 40 students at a time doing various projects there. Bellarmine University has a class sustainable action workshop where students learn about sustainability and they use the town as their laboratory. And so here they are on Bellarmine's campus um, with our compost van making compost for uh, the Bellarmine community farm. Um, we have a historically black college Simmons, um, which is nearby. We partner in public service requirements that they have. Um, and so um, we're really happy for the relationship with Simmons. We've got a couple of photos there of people doing vermicomposting and composting from Simmons. Um, students from high schools, students from elementary schools. Uh, we've got a collegiate as a private high school and secondary uh, lower school that uh, comes out and helps us. We do compostable education, uh, trash talking, if you will, telling people what's compostable and what's not in the student cafeteria areas. Uh, we partner with theater, math, and housing uh, with these green bins. Um, I know there are going to be questions about housing, so let me just take a moment to say uh, we do it. So I send the student workers in, or I go in myself, and we pull out the compost bins. Uh, right now, we are between projects. We've done, we've done projects with housing twice, and with changes in leadership, they've uh, gone backward and come forward. And so anyway, we're in a, we're in a cycle, um, so, uh, but we have a lot of experience working in dorms and in other areas on campus. Community engagement, radio stuff, do a lot of radio stuff. The TV comes out sometimes. Uh, here I am talking on Crescent Hill Radio um, and also on these other affiliates um, about the project that gets people to come out. Uh, Nathan Hendrickson is a local artist. Uh, he made this van. People love the van when they see it. It helps people come out. Um, Robin worked with the Ohio Valley Creative Energy um, 
to capture methane to do work. Uh, that's a product project in southern Indiana. And she set up her little farm with our compost and got us a lot of good uh, publicity in southern Indiana, which created a lot of volunteers. It's only 10 minutes away across the bridge. So it's nice to have those folks. Uh, Genscape is one of our partners that pays us. I put your, I put their um, <laughs> um, uh, URL up there if anybody wants to check them out. They do big data and they have a kitchen and they compost all their food waste and we pick it up every week and they pay for the student workers. Naive Restaurant uh, is local, um, organic, um, interested in compostables. We compost their food waste. They pay for our student workers. 1400 Willow, uh, upscale uh, condominiums uh, in the park, beautiful stuff. Uh, their, their residents have a deal with us where we'll get their compostables. Um, and uh, the Louisville Compost Co-op is a for-profit organization that uh, has a membership um, program where people can get a bucket of comp uh, a bucket to put their compostables in every week. It costs them 20 bucks a month to have that picked up every week, and they bring the compostables to us. Uh, we're getting compostables from all over town because of this group, which is why we need to upgrade our license to a better license, the one that we're going to get through Kentucky, um, hopefully here very shortly. Um, I'm also really proud of um, this food recovery group. A couple of those students in there um, started thinking about some food issues when they came out to the composting project and echo reps also helped push them in this um, developing a food recovery network um, program and uh, we're just really proud of them for the work that they've done in finding another alternative because of course composting is great but as Jen said in her presentation uh, man it's really great when we can do something something better with that stuff and there it is a little over but um, yeah thanks Anybody, by the way, should reach out to me. My information's on there because you can reach out to me. So if anybody wants to, please, please do, because I know the convers I know the time's short for conversations here. Thank you, Larry. Thanks so much, Brian. That that is a you know almost overwhelming amount of work that y'all have done in the last many years. Um, we had a couple questions uh, that we'll cover real quick and then move on. Um, the first is you gave the 20 ton number. Is that inputs or outputs so um that's output so that's the that's the compostables that we end up making great and um then can you talk a little bit more about your um theory of how this project uh fits in with social justice oh man thank you for that i wish we had more time somebody email me um so essentially you use the um you use the worms as the foundation for the soil and the soil becomes the foundation of what do we do differently with our trash people in vulnerable circumstances um, people with social justice challenges the poor just for example um, they uh, they could do something different with their trash all of us could right but this is the way that i was sort of educated in it and that trash can be used as a resource to make compost and then you can use the compost um, to grow food, right? And then once I know how to grow food, I can save seeds from that. All of this can be ultimately a zero cost thing, right? Because I, I end up saving my uh, trash to make the compost. I end up saving my seeds to make the food. And then that becomes the foundation for, you know, when one person's doing it, that becomes the foundation for growth, right? We want to get neighborhoods doing this, right? So that they can make community gardens, so that the neighborhoods can come together share resources, share labor, share food, maybe we get an excess. Maybe we can hire people with that, right? Provide, um, you know, some, some employment. Um, we, we can educate the young in that area, right? Especially when we have, uh, you know, more vulnerable populations, sometimes it's difficult for the youth to see their way forward. And this provides real life skills, right? Not just on the composting side, but the food growing side, the food preparation side, the food selling side, the food cleaning side, packaging. I mean, all of these things, right? And so, um, yeah, that's that's a lot of where the social justice goes. It, it's closing all of those loops and empowering people to do the stuff for themselves, initially with their trash. So, great. Um, two more quick questions. Um, you mentioned you give everything away. Do you yeah. ever have any trouble? getting rid of the finished material? Nope. <laughs> I mean, there was a time, I suppose, um, when people didn't know about us, but we put it all into, there are four 
gardens on campus that take our compostables regularly, including one that we manage on site. Um, we started the we started the site um, early on, it was just on asphalt. And so we've built up about six inches of soil on that site from composting um, and making soil and putting it down there. So um, yeah, early on we had some challenges, but partnering with uh, Raising Hope Farm, for example, um, partnering with the Master Gardener Program um, and having those garden outlets on campus has really made it easier um, for us to not be overwhelmed. As a matter of fact, I mean, we could, I just did the math the other day to be sure. I mean, we could, we could triple our capacity on site right now um, because of the way that we're, just because of the way that we've been managing it. So we, we've got room to grow. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. We're going to head uh, over to our final presenter now. Um, Gina Talt is Food Systems Project Specialist with Princeton University's Office of Sustainability. She manages project-based operational and research efforts with the objective of developing best practices for food systems sustainability for Princeton University and other institutions. She currently oversees the sustainable composting research at Princeton, the SCRAP lab, an investigation into organics recycling and soil revitalization through small scale in vessel composting. Gina also assists university faculty in studying how different farming styles and environmental factors impact crop productivity, biodiversity, and income on New Jersey farms. Gina holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a certificate in environmental studies from Princeton University. Take it away, Gina. Hey. Well, thank you very much, Larry, for the introduction. And thank you as well to my co-presenters, Jen and Brian. Um, definitely left me with a tough uh, act to follow. And I learned a lot, too, that I'll, I'll take back for my own program. Um, so as Larry mentioned, I'm the operational manager of uh, the Scrap Lab, uh, Sustainable Composting Research at Princeton lab, which features in-vessel composting. So a little bit different from what the other two presenters are doing on their campus. And again, uh, the project represents our investigation into using on-site small-scale composting technology to simultaneously um, move the needle towards both zero waste and then also using the resulting compost to create healthy and uh, resilient um, habitats on campus. Uh, which are two of uh, the major goals in uh, the Princeton's new Sustainability Action Plan, which was re just released last month. So before I dive deeper into the project, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of Princeton's Food Scraps Diversion Program to highlight the importance sometimes of having a diver diversified approach to organics recycling. Um, so Princeton, um, just for background, um, has about 8,000 uh, combined undergraduate and graduate students and another 7,000 uh, staff and faculty over um, 240 buildings on 500 acres. Uh, so as early as 1997, Princeton has been recovering and repurposing food waste on campus. Um, so currently, um, all of the food scraps from dining halls um, pre-consumer and post-consumers. Um, we collect them and we partner with a private company called Organic Diversion, which brings the uneaten food to New Jersey farms to be composted in windrows or used as pig feed. Uh, so the majority of uneaten food that is composted in this avenue um, is uh, at about 64 tons uh, per month. Uh, meanwhile, um, all the pre-consumer and leftover food, uh, un uneaten food from our campus center and cafes, as well as a growing number of non-dining venue uh, locations are sent to the scrap lab, uh, which processes currently six tons uh, per month. So definitely only about 10% of the total uh, food that is recovered on campus, uh, which was intentional. I think Jen um, said it well, um, it pretty much we wanna make sure that we pilot a technology and the supporting operations before we invest in, a, in the approach campus-wide. Um, and last year, I just wanted to mention that our dining uh, team is, has also started food recovery too, um, which we're, we're excited about because um, of course we want to help feed 
um, needy families in the in the area before anything goes to compost. Okay. And uh, just the brief overview of uh, the Scrap Lab and the technology. So we started operations just a few months ago, uh, September 2018. Uh, the project features a four solutions model 1000 composting system, which has a capacity of 5,000 pounds per week of uneaten food, uh, plus an addition of a bulking agent or carbon source. Uh, it uses aerobic and vessel rotary drum technology uh, that has a programmed auto digest cycle with um, an aeration uh, blower every 15 minutes and then a rotation every hour. And from when you load um, the food to when it comes out, um, that's a process of about uh, five days. Okay. And I know everyone's here because of the student engagement uh, piece, so I wanted to definitely highlight that. Um, so in the Office of Sustainability's programming here, we, we aim to try to cultivate an ethos of sustainability on campus by operating at the intersection of campus operations, uh, communications and, and engagement in campus life, and, as well as academics. So whenever possible, we like to engage students in all three of these aspects so that they graduate with the knowledge, skills, and behaviors to advance sustainability action, whether in their own lives or on larger scales. Um, so I'll go through each one of these components. Uh, so with the operations, um, I have uh, 10 uh, student workers who each work one or, or two shifts per week. Um, in addition to myself, um, we um, run uh, the system, which uh, involves first uh, weighing um, the bins of uneaten food that come to us. So all of the uh, campus center and cafe uh, food comes in 32 gallon totes, which we weigh on the scale in the first picture. Um, and then we weigh all the, the food for the day to help us determine how much carbon source we have to add. So currently we're, we're doing about 30% uh, um, of carbon or um, what we're using right now is kiln dried wood shavings from uh, that we buy in bulk from a local distributor. Although we, we do want to test different sources going forward, uh, potentially um, wood chips on campus. So it was great to hear from Jen about you know, how they invested in, in, a, in a screener there. Um, but anyway, so after we weigh uh, the totes of food, we uh, put them into an industrial lift arm, which is in the second picture on the top. And then students um, help with um, operating that lifter and it pretty much um, goes up, forms an arc, and then it dumps into the hopper, uh, which you can see in the top uh, image on the right. And once it falls through the hopper, it reaches the shredder. The shredder grinds up the material, and then it goes up the auger arm, which is, inside is basically just a screw conveyor that brings the material up um, to the top, where it empties into the digestion uh, vessel. Um, and another task that we have to do is we, we clean out the buckets on site, uh, just sprinting it uh, two or three times uh, with water instead of using plastic uh, bags or compostable bags, but we don't want to use bags in general or compostable bags in general because they'll, they won't um, process correctly in the shredder. Um, and that process, and if we're also offloading compost, which you can see in the bottom right, um, engaging some students with uh, shoveling and raking uh, the compost as it falls out of the, the screener on the, the offload end. Um, so altogether, it takes anywhere from two to three hours, uh, depending upon what task we do, because we don't always offload compost. Um, we only do that twice a week while we load um, food about four four times per week. So I know I mentioned that the capacity is 5,000 pounds, um, but currently we're doing closer to um, 3,500 pounds, which um, is great because it leaves some room to try to grow across campus in non-dining venues. And as I mentioned, we've partnered with um, some academic departments, uh, a food co-op on campus, a coffee club on campus to try to uh, recover more um, food that currently would otherwise be going to the landfill. 
So I'm excited about, you know, continuing to form more partnerships. Okay. And then on the communications and engagement side of things. So um, one way we have engaged students is through the graphic design. Um, so a lot of the graphics that you just saw in this presentation, all of them were uh, created by students, uh, whether in a class or just um, paid um, by my office uh, to do so. So we've got been able to get a logo and a, a better um, kind of visual of what happens inside of the digestion vessel. Um, another way we engage students is through resource recovery at campus events. So in the middle there, you see uh, Wesley, who's one of our eco reps um, at a, a Tiger Sustainability Night, a basketball game where um, we try to intercept attendees to make sure that they discarded their materials either in trash recycling or compost and included some informational materials about um, where the, the food was going after, after the event. Um, so another one is uh, composting education. So I touched on it briefly, but um, I've been able to partner with interested, interested students and staff to introduce compost collection bins, um, more so these five gallon bins um, in their departments. And it's been great because those um, highly enthusiastic students and staff have been able to do the education of the occupants in their building. And that's that just, you know, it's great because it just gives me and my team um, time to just spend collecting the buckets and processing them. And so I've, I've, it's been great to, you know, have these five partnerships already, but um, we want to try to expand that in the next uh, academic year. And then lastly, um, through uh, waste audits. So uh, the picture on the left, you see two students um, helping us look at um, the breakdown of discarded materials at a late meal on campus, which is kind of like a fourth meal after dinner, um, like 8 30 to 10, 10 o'clock at the, the campus center. Um, so at that location, we do source our um, pre consumer leftover um, food, but we want to try to get into that post consumer space as well. Um, you know, currently, we have a bin for that, but it's too highly contaminated. So we wanted to see, you know, exactly what was going in it. And we found out that it was mostly just serviceware rather than, than food scraps. Um, so going into kind of the next part of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about our work so far to try to divert um, serviceware from, from the landfill. Okay. And then just uh, touching on the last component, the academic side, um, you know, like my uh, co-presenters mentioned, um, on-site campus composting provides great opportunities to engage students in their coursework to see how what they learn in class can be applied to um, real world life uh, sustainability problem solving, which, you know, as everyone knows, it's, it's not um, perfect. And I think students um, can get to see the nuances of, you know, tackling um, sustainability challenges um, rather than just uh, sometimes in class, like concepts can just be very theoretical. So uh, being able to uh, have an avenue for applied research um, so that can come in the form of just class tours or um, coursework final papers, as well as uh, larger uh, faculty or student independent research projects. Okay, and so for the um, compostable serviceware topic, um, we are actively testing different types of compostable serviceware in the composting system to determine which ones can or can't be broken down by this technology to better inform the alternative plastics industry as well as campus signing for their procurement strategy in an effort to be as zero waste as possible. So this chart is what we know already from previous testing by the four solutions manufacturer. And we have used this as a launching pad to test current campus products. So what we knew from the onset was that anything with a thick PLA wax lined liner does not work, uh, such as hot beverage containers or cups. Um, the manufacturer saw that they, these didn't even break down over nine months just because um, you need a commercial facility um, with a much higher uh, heat generation to break these down. Um, and so, and 
as I mentioned, like the compostable bags are also not acceptable because they'll, they'll jam um, the shredder. So uh, naturally we started off testing uh, bamboo or palm uh, or wood-based products. So we had a campus event where we were able to divert um, around 150 pounds of compostable material, most of which were <laughs> these um, uh, bamboo palm products. Um, so being able to receive a large load can really tell you, you know, whether or not um, these types of products can break down. So what we found was um, kind of mixed results. Um, I mean, these products will eventually biodegrade, but the shredder wasn't, wasn't able to shred them completely. We received some of these long unshredded shards coming out of the system, which is, as I mentioned, okay, but depending upon how you want to use the compost um, afterwards, it, it could, you know, be uh, problematic. Um, and so, Another thing I guess in that, that picture was that like chopsticks and coffee stir, stirs or other like small picks will just fall like, right through the shredder unscathed and will remain intact in the compost. Um, as you can see on um, the bottom most um, shard there in the picture. Um, but of course, as I said, they'll, they will eventually biodegrade. Um, so because of the mixed results with the um, bamboo and because our ground staff was a little skeptical, skeptical um, about using it in their, um, using the compost in their, their equipment, um, we're turning to investigating whether um, chinette plates, these um, white uh, molded recycled fiber plates and um, these rural centric plant fiber clamshells will um, be able to compost uh, readily in the system. And so far we've seen pretty promising results. So what we're doing now is trying to collect a larger sample so we can better um, understand our compostability. Uh, so um, these pictures kind of show two events where we've composted or, or collected uh, these types of plates and clamshells. And on the right, uh, you can see um, how they fall through the, sh um, through the hopper and get get eaten up by the, the shredder. Okay. And then lastly, what's also accept, acceptable, which is a great uh, diversion um, tactic, is to um, collect greasy pizza boxes, because we all know that those are a bane um, for recyclers um, with, with their equipment. Um, and those have, have been able to be processed um, successfully. And they can also even help with the bulking agent carbon source side, although they're not quite as high quality as, as wood shavings per se. Okay, and um, just highlighting some challenges, next steps going forward. Um, so one of them is uh, process optimization. So right now, a lot of, of the nitrogen or food that we get coming out of the cafes tends to just be leftovers, which have a very high moisture content. So we're still, um, you know, trying to investigate different approaches for um, more properly composting high moisture feedstocks um, and looking at uh, this summer, we'll be looking at different aeration uh, durations as well as trying different types of feedstock, um, perhaps um, like a, a hay or alfalfa uh, type of material, or even trying to look at the possibility of using campus wood chips if we chip them up a little bit more finer, if that will help us divert another uh, campus stream. Um, secondly, we're going to continue to study the compostable serviceware potential and try to align our procurement decisions accordingly. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to try to also expand the diversion potential to other campus locations um, and not just the, the major dining venues, um, as well as at um, uh, more highly trafficked, trafficked events on campus. And um, we're also going to um, because we just started um, back in the fall and over the winter, like this is the time where we can actually start testing different compost products. Uh, right now, our grounds department is blending some of the scrap lab compost with their uh, soil and other uh, leafy compost and creating different blends and, and starting to spread it across campus. And then I'm working with a faculty member this summer to see how we can use compost tea using the scrap lab compost to substitute for uh, chemical-based inputs in um, food growing operations. 
And lastly, by the end of this pilot period, we really want to understand the costs and benefits of small scale aerobic um, in vessel uh, composting systems and to, to develop a how to guide uh, for other institutions willing to take this approach. Um, yeah. And lastly, uh, thank you uh, very much. I have my contact information on the left if anyone uh, wants to ask or learn more uh, about our operations. Or you can also uh, subscribe to our blog for updates at scraplab.princeton.edu. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gina. That's that's um, uh, another interesting take uh, on on doing food race diversion. So thank you so much for that presentation. We do have a couple questions. Um, so obviously this is kind of the high tech, um, a high tech way to address uh, what we've been talking about all afternoon. Um, do you have any preliminary? numbers on what the carbon footprint of the operation of the machinery is, how much energy does it consume, um, what's the net balance uh, for producing the finished compost? Sure, yeah, um, that's definitely by the end of like the next year and a half, I'll have the full analysis on that. Um, we, you know, we do we have a, uh, we just put in place a sub meter on the system to better understand the electricity loads. Um, one thing just to mention, um, over the winter, we do use electric heaters to make sure that the inside of this facility, which is basically just like a large hoop house like structure um, with some ventilation um, to see kind of like what the energy demands are during times of the year when um, we need at least some heat for, for um, us working there and also just to keep the, the microbes happy inside. Um, but yeah, no, not yet, but we are starting uh, that process and comparing it to, you know, how much it would take to or you know, pay a hauler to haul this material out. And here in New Jersey, our landfill uh, hauling and tipping fees are pretty high. They're about 120 uh, per ton. So uh, for us, it, it that definitely helps make the the cost argument. Um, Great. Um, then another question: How how do you handle collections from the buildings? Is that your staff, or do you have partners within facilities, or how when it's collected at food service, how does it get to the scrap lab? Yeah, that's great. So we have a loading dock at the the campus center. So everything that's generated there, um, of course, just goes downstairs, um, gets. Uh, dumped into the buckets and then they go downstairs to the loading dock. Uh, the campus cafes are all around campus. So at the end of the day, any leftover food, there's a uh, dining staff that cart the leftover trays back to the Frisk Campus Center and then they uh, dump the leftover materials into our 32 gallon totes. Um, so every morning then our building services staff, uh, the sanitation workers, they come with a large um, uh, box truck with a, a lift gate. And so they roll the totes onto that truck, um, strap them, um, and then bring them uh, about a half, half a mile away to our facility. Um, in terms of the smaller five gallon bins, it's kind of been like an ad hoc approach. Um, whichever locations are really close to the first uh, loading dock, I have um, the, um, spearheaders um, in those departments or or residential halls um, bring the buckets to the loading docks for a certain number of days per week and then they get uh, brought to the facility when the, the larger bins do and then um, for the one for the locations that are a bit further away from the loading dock I have a team of students and I we, we collect the, the bins on golf carts and we, we transport them to the facility. Um, so going forward, we want to try to at least do something similar to, I guess, what Jen's program said, trying to create more centralized locations where people can just, um, you know, dump their containers into the larger 32 gallon totes um, and also be able to make the case to the university to support um, more expanded hauling services, which is currently our, our bottleneck. Great. Thank you, Gina. That's all the time we've got for questions today. Um, 
I uh, just want to uh, remind everyone that following this webinar, you should receive a prompt to quickly complete a survey, um, or I'm sorry, to complete a quick survey. You can take as much time as you want. Uh, we encourage you to take a minute to give us feedback on today's program. Again, we want to thank AISHI for their support of the 2019 webinar series, along with the Big Ten and Friends Waste Affinity Group for their participation today. And one last time, um, I want to uh, ask you to join me in thanking Jen, Brian, and Gina for their presentations today. Um, look for their presentations on the Kirk website uh, and, uh, and a recording of this program in the next couple of days. Uh, a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention. Um, our next webinar in the series will be Thursday, May 30th. Um, the State of the Recycling Industry, Education and Operation best practices for a challenging recycling market. Uh, watch our website and your email for announcement um, of that uh, registration being open. And you can always go back and look at our archive of programs on our website, www.kirk3r.org. Uh, also, I want to bring to your attention some coming events. Coming up in, next month is the 2019 Green Sports Alliance Summit uh, in Philadelphia. You can get more information on their website, greensportsalliance.org slash summit. And of course, the 2019 AC conference is coming up in Spokane, Washington, October 27th through 30th. Again, this year, Kirk will sponsor a pre-conference workshop on the Sunday before and registration for that will be available through the AC website. Uh, one more thank you for our webinar partners and I appreciate your attendance today. Have a great afternoon.